Um, just to reiterate the point that Baby Beneath Gore made, um, this speech here it was written specifically for the youth, and I know everyone's been sitting for a really long time, but it's just our humble binti that you guys sit down because this was written for you. My name is Jasmine Gore. I'm an organizer with Azadi. Azadi is an organization that started in Canada. Um, we started Azadi because we wanted to see our generation wake up. We wanted to awaken the revolutionaries that already exist within all of us. They're just asleep. So I want to just take everyone back for a minute. I want you to imagine that you're standing in the Dvarasad right now. And as you're staring into that blue Sarovar, suddenly it is filled with red. Suddenly all you can see is red. As you step forward, you begin to gasp for air and you choke on smoke. There is a mother standing beside you. And her screams pierce your ears until she is silenced by a bullet and then all you can hear are the cries of the child left in her arms. From a distance you manage to, cap cap you manage to catch a glimpse of a sing in the Vasa he refuses to allow a battle to stop Keithin from going on in the Vasab until a bullet hits him in the chest. And as you walk forward and you keep moving, you see tanks approaching Agatha, destroying everyone and everything in their path. They want the Gorsiks inside that building crushed just as much as they want the spirit of all dissenting minorities crushed. But all you can hear from the Vasab at Jagare. All you can see are Gursiks in Chardikala who have already attained their victory because they didn't refuse to turn their back on their guru. And then everything goes dark. And now you're standing in a forest and everything is completely silent. You are standing lined up in a row of Gursiks, your hands tied behind your backs. The Gorsiks standing beside you begin to recite Lava. They are reciting Lava with smiles on their faces because they are about to meet their bride. They are about to meet Shahidi. But they don't get past Sahed Anand Hoa Vardapagi as one by one they are shot down and then a gun is placed to your forehead and everything goes dark. And now you're standing inside cement walls. There's a woman sitting on a chair in this room, tears running down her face. Three police officers surround her and ask her the same question over and over again. Where is your husband? She remains silent. And through her tears, she manages to smile and says not a word. She will not comply. And then her kameez is ripped off her chest and her screams reverberate against those walls and her screams will stay ringing in your ears but no one else in Punjab will hear them. And then everything goes dark. You're sitting in a prison cell with a sing who's reciting it at us. Suddenly the prison bars open and a police officer grabs him off the ground, pushes him into an interrogation room, electric wires are placed in his mouth and police officers begin to shock him. For 20 minutes straight you listen to his screams until he places his thumbprint on a blank piece of paper. He has just signed a confession to a crime that he never committed. So when you imagine the scenes that I just described to you, your first thought was probably 1984. What people don't realize is that most of what I just described took place in the 90s and into very recent times. It was 1984 when young Singhs would go missing through open job in the 90s, shot down in police encounters that no one would ever hear about. It was 1984 when mothers like Bibi were raped and tortured in interrogation in 1993. It was 1984 when our brothers and fathers of Professor Devinder Paul Singh were tortured into false confessions just in this last decade. It was 1984, just this past March, when Pai Pa Singh, a French nationalist activist who's been fighting the drug epidemic in Punjab, was convicted of 10 years in prison for falsely planted evidence and none of us blinked an eye. So when we talk about 30 years since 1984, what do we really mean? We repeat the number 30 over and over and over again as though we're 30 years away from 84. 
The reality is that it doesn't matter if it's 30 years or 29 years or 58 years or 72 years, Punjab is still living under the same oppression. It is still 1984. There may no longer be tanks in Darbar Sahib and there may no longer be curfews in Punjab. There may no longer be bodies piling up, but there is still a silent genocide taking place. The system that brought about 1984 is still in power in India and still working to crush the Sikh movement. We know of torture taking place of Sikh political prisoners behind prison walls. False charges are laid on our brothers and sisters in Punjab and most of us are hardly aware of it. Drugs have been strategically flooded into Punjab. There are more liquor stores in Punjab than there are in any other area of India. You have to ask yourself why that is. It isn't an accident that carts of drugs manage to enter Punjab's borders every year. Drugs are brought into Punjab with the compliance of the Indian government to keep the youth of Punjab sedated. When the people are silenced, when 75% of youth in certain areas of Punjab are addicted to drugs, what movement of the people can exist? Resources are being taken out of Punjab. Farmers are committing suicide because they can no longer afford to make a living off their land. Farmers are suffering to the point where they're taking their own lives. There's a cancer epidemic being caused by chemical toxins flooding the rivers and soil of Punjab and few, so, few of us are even aware of that. Our Akal Takht, our throne of political and spiritual sovereignty has been invaded by has been invaded by the state of India and fallen to corruption. Our Akal Takht, established by Guru Har Gobind Sahib Ji, meant to stand for the sovereignty of all human beings in the face of oppression is in the hands of our oppressors. Even the recent incident that took place at the Dabar Sahib just two days ago. We think that it was our own people, but we don't realize is that, that that incident took place with the compliance of the Indian government. Why? It took place so that they would distract us from 1984, distract us from the real issues facing Punjab. This is the 1984 that we're living through. It's 1984 when all of this is taking place in Punjab and we as Sikhs are silent about it. It's 1984 when the Indian government has suppressed our people and infiltrated our minds to the point where we feel shame in speaking out for ourselves and demanding Khalistan. It's 1984 when India has placed us in such a state of complacency where we can't even demand our own freedom, our own right to self-determination without thinking twice. Over the last month, our community has repeated the line 30 years no justice over and over and over again. But how long have we actually spent reflecting on what justice means within Sikhi? So just imagine that tomorrow, Sajjan Kumar, Kamal Nath, and all those other politicians who were involved in the 84 genocide were actually sentenced and hanged to death for the role in 1984. Would that be the justice that we're looking for? Would that, re would that end our rallies and protests and vigils? India has actually financially compensated families in Punjab who are directly affected by the genocide with about 4,000 American dollars. Is that justice for the destruction caused to tens of thousands of families across Punjab? For financial compensation, would we sell the dignity of our fathers the thought rolling in the filth of an Indian prison and call it justice? Would we sell the honor of our mothers and sisters and daughters in police stations across India and call it justice? Would we accept apologies and sentences 30 years after we saw young boys who were lovingly sent off to school in the morning but become lifeless bodies in the canals of Punjab? Would we call that justice? If Modi himself stood on a stage and apologized to all of Punjab, to the entire Sikh calm for 1984, would that be justice? We need to start thinking about what justice means within Sikhi. As Sikhs, we have always defined justice by personal responsibility and action. We reflect, we move, and we respond. 1984 was not the first time that Thirbhasa was attacked. After by Mani Singh Ji's Shahidi in 1737, Masa Rangar invaded Thirbhasa. He brought prostitutes and alcohol into the Thirbhasa complex. And when news reached by Sukha Singh and by Matab Singh, they left immediately for Amitsar. Masa Rangar was beheaded in 1740, and Thirbhasa became back in the control of Sikhs. In 1746, the Barsa was desecrated again by Lakhpat Rai. During this period, a total of 10,000 Sikhs were killed. 7,000 Sikhs died in battle. 3,000 were publicly executed. By 1748, Jassa Singh al led Khalsa forces to reclaim Amritsar, and Sirbat Khalsa was held. In 1757, Ahmed Shah Dali invaded India, and upon entering, he destroyed the Barsa. He filled the Barsa with garbage and waste. 
Immediately, Baba Deep Singh Gay rose up, and a group of Gorsiks, heavily outnumbered, fought and reclaimed the Basai. Abdali came back in 1762. This time, he inflicted the Vardak Alugara, which resulted in 30,000 Sikh deaths. And before he had left Punjab, he actually had the Basai blown up with gunpowder. In the same year, Dasa Singh Alawaliya led Khalsa forces back to reclaim the Basai. Abdali came back again in 1764, and this time he went directly for the Basai. And when he arrived, there were actually 36 left in the Basai. Sarbat Khalsa had decided that the Panth would leave, but 36 refused. They did their final adas to give Shahidi, defending their Guru. And when Abdali's forces arrived, they saw 30 people dressed beautifully as though they were going to a wedding. They had hods around their neck, they were dressed in beautiful clothing. This is an act of defiance against a system that wanted to see them crumble. And all of those Gorsiks gave Shahidi. And in 1984, the Dabar was attacked. And it wasn't to flush out militants who were hiding there. It was an attempt to attack our psyches, to crush our revolutionary spirit. In the days leading up to the Dabar Sahib attack, Gorsiks were coming in huge numbers, not out of fear, not out of the need for refuge, but out of defense, out of the, the desire to die defending the Dabar Sahib, because that is the sick way. The sick way is to face injustice head on, whatever the cost. Those Gorsiks came to the Dabar Sahib ready to defend a consciousness of revolution, an ideology of freedom. Sings in the Dabar Sahib openly said, let them come, we will give them battle. Let them come, we will give them battle. They were able to say that and live by that promise because they understood the revolutionary ideology that Sikhi comes from. They understood, that, they understood that for a Sikh, a building or a structure can be destroyed and rebuilt. But if we lose our spiritual and political consciousness, if we lose our integrity, if we lose our will to fight oppression, there's no coming back from that. Gosiks at that time were able to say, let them come, we will give them battle, because they accepted that bodies could be destroyed, but the spirit, our spirit could not. We remember the attack on the Dabar solemnly and mournfully, but we forget the uncrushable spirit of Jadvi Glad that Gosiks had as they laid down their lives. And when they laid down their lives, it wasn't against India, it wasn't against a particular group, it was against oppression itself. For a Sikh, the enemy is not physical, it has always been a force within the mind that wishes to control and oppress. So fast forward to the current moment, where we are still being suppressed by the Indian government, but we are also suppressing ourselves. Something is wrong when our own people can say, why can't we move on from 1984? Punjab is peaceful now. Silence in the graveyard of Punjab is not peace. The superficial form of peace that we see in Punjab every day is the silencing of our people through decades of trauma. Something is wrong when we as Sikhs have forgotten who we are and hesitate to openly advocate for sovereignty. Something is wrong when we view Khalistan and Azad Punjab as a land that does not belong to every single one of us. In Sikhi there is no such thing as separatism. People have these fears of Sikh separatism, but in Sikhi there is no such thing as separatism. We come from Echo on God. The idea that God is one, the unity of all life, the unity of that divine. Within that sense of wet and oneness, we recognize ourselves in each other, we recognize ourselves in the oppressed. Another suffering is our own suffering. When one person bleeds, all of us bleed. We recognize the equality of all human beings, and if we truly believe in the equality of all beings, we should advocate for the protection of the rights of every single being. If we truly believe that we are one with all people, how can we live under a state that treats us and other minorities as less than human? How can we as a people who stand for truth and integrity live under a state that stands for corruption and genocide? How can we as a people who stand for the human rights of all